Good morning, everyone, and welcome to all of you in the audience, as well as those of you who are viewing in from at home electronically. And it's so good to look out and actually see people. And I'm so happy to be back in this building, which I've missed very much. And if Harvest Cafe could just open up, we'd, we'd be all set, right? Okay, so I'm really pleased to be here with you to attend the first inaugural NEXT seminar. For those of you who are new to IFNH, I mean, sorry, new to Rutgers, the New Jersey Institute for Food, Nutrition, and Health was started in 2008 with a $10 million capital award from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The beautiful building that we sit in today and which has become a centerpiece of our campus was completed in 2015. The overall goal of the Institute is to advance educate and promote issues of nutrition and wellness that lead to a healthy lifestyle. The success of the Institute builds on its interdisciplinary centers, which have specific missions within the broader goal. In 2019, Dr. Sue Shapsis initiated a new center, which she and her colleagues dubbed NEXT for human nutrition exercise, and metabolism. The primary goals of the center are to optimize body composition and metabolism through nutrition and novel techniques that improve muscle and bone strength, maximize growth, and delay loss of function associated with aging. This center is unique as it uses state-of-the-art equipment to conduct human clinical research right here in the IFNH building drawing on the expertise of a range of faculty from different units across Rutgers and the medical school. I'm really looking forward to seeing the results of their exciting programs in the coming years. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Shapsis for further comments. So I thank you, Wendy, for giving the introduction to both the IFNH and the NEXT Center that that spares me the obligation of introducing it to all of you. Indeed, we have education, research, and outreach components to the center. And um, we're really looking forward to exciting projects coming up this year now that the non-essential research can start with COVID restrictions for the past two years. So without further ado, I am going to introduce Dr. Tracy Anthony, who's hosting the seminar today for our esteemed speaker, Dr. Lehman. And I'm just gonna say, take it away, Tracy. Thank you, Dr. Shapsis, for your introductory comments and for leading the NEXT Center and establishing this prestigious event. Thank you to Dr. Kohik for your words of welcome and your leadership. And it is now my great honor and privilege to introduce my friend and doctoral mentor, Dr. Donald K. Lehman, as the inaugural next seminar speaker. Dr. Lehman's passion for nutrition, agriculture, and food was born from the earth as Don was raised on a family farm in Illinois. The strong work ethic he gained in those formative years, he took with him to Illinois State University, earning a bachelor's degree in chemistry and a master's degree in biochemistry and organic chemistry. He found at university that he quite liked pipetting over plowing. So he then went on to earn a doctorate in human nutrition and biochemistry at the University of Minnesota, studying the effect of dietary restriction on muscle growth and metabolism under Pat Swan. From there, he accepted the opportunity to start his own lab at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. No postdoc required. <laughs> Don's scholarly pursuits remain grounded there to the present, where he is now Professor Emeritus in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition. Don has received numerous awards for his research, notably the BioServe Award from the American Society for Nutrition, 
the Shannon Award from the National Institutes of Health, and the Nutrition and Metabolism Society National Research Leadership Award. Dr. Lehman has over 100 peer-reviewed publications, and he continues to publish in top scientific journals. Notably, uh, a recent article in Nature Communications, I uh, recommend you Google after his talk. Dr. Lehman has served as associate editor of the Journal of Nutrition, and he currently serves as associate editor of the Journal of Nutrition Education and Behavior, and on the editorial boards of Nutrition and Metabolism and Nutrition Research and Practice. Dr. Lehman has an extensive consulting background, including work with NASA, the Shriners Children's Hospital, the US Air Force, plus numerous companies and organizations, including Kraft Foods, Nestle, and the National Dairy Council. Throughout his career, Don's work has functioned as a bridge between the basic science going on at the bench and the basic messages being shared at the breakfast, lunch, and dinner tables. Dr. Lehman has been a leader in research about protein, nutrition for athletic performance, obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular health for over 40 years. And he continues to be an academic opinion leader in the agricultural and food sectors. The years I spent under his direction changed the course of my career and life for the better. And he has at least 40 graduate students and many undergraduate students who could claim the same. Don is a great storyteller. But more importantly, he challenges you to think differently. And this is the essence and purpose of higher education. And he is an exemplar. So with that, I welcome him to Rutgers University and I warmly invite him to the podium. Hoping I can put that on my collar. Is that seeming to work? Okay. Uh, maybe I'll have to hold it. Uh. Technologically challenged, though. Okay, I think we're ready. If everyone can turn off their phones, thanks so much. Turn down the volume. Well, thank you for the introduction, and thank you, Tracy, for all the kind words. I think one of the great pleasures uh, as being a professor is, is watching young people develop and getting a chance to do that. Also, I appreciate being invited to the uh, Human Nutrition metabolism Exercise and Metabolism uh, inaugural uh, lecture. Uh, really an honor to do that. And I think this talk about leucine to muscle health kind of encompasses that. It sort of reflects my thinking uh, about uh, nutrition and integration with exercise physiology and advanced sort of nutritional bio, uh, biochemical metabolism types of things. So I think it really does a nice job of integrating what the next center is really about. And so first, as I, before I start, I'd like to apologize to all the researchers and great investigators and labs out there that have worked in this field. I'm going to really tell this story from my perspective, so hopefully not overlooking and offending everyone else along the way. That's not going to work. So we'll... Um, okay, so leucine is one of the three branch chain amino acids. Oh, good. Three, leucine is one of the three branch chain amino acids, and they're kind of unusual. Uh, they make up fairly a large amount of our dietary food supply. If you just think about them in relationship to the 20 naturally occurring amino acids, they would account for about numerically about 15%. 
But in most of our normal food supply, they account for about 25%. Within skeletal muscle, they account for 35%. 35% of myofibular proteins are branched-chain amino acids, and almost 50% of the essential amino acids in muscle are branched-chain amino acids. So they are a very dominant amino acid in the supply. Leucine is one of the first amino acids ever discovered way back in the early 1800s. Uh, really didn't gain too much attention until W.C. Rose at the University of Illinois started looking at it around uh, the World War II, 1940 range. And he started feeding it to animals sort of as a supplement. He knew that there was some anabolic potential with leucine, and so he started adding it as a supplement. And what he found was in some cases it seemed to be an anabolic stimulant, and in some cases it didn't. And that's a theme I want you to think about as we go along. Leucine sometimes seems to work and sometimes doesn't seem to work. And what are the conditions that determine that? I first got interested in leucine when I was in graduate school. Uh, and there was a number of labs, um, Fox and Goldberg, Bruce and Reed, Lee and Jefferson. There were a number of different labs that were showing leucine had an anabolic potential to stimulate protein synthesis in skeletal muscle. But again, there were other labs that showed no effect, McNurling garlic, no effect of leucine. And so again, we get this conflict. Sometimes it seems to work, and sometimes it doesn't. One of the other interesting things about leucine metabolism to sort of paint the whole picture is, is how it's metabolized and degraded in the body. So as Tracy mentioned, I worked with Pat Swan uh, at Minnesota, and she did her PhD with Al Harper at Wisconsin. Harper was very interested in this metabolism across different tissues. And so as I think as you probably mostly know, uh, most amino acids are degraded in the liver. That's the site of the transaminases, it's the site of the urea cycle. The exception to that are the branch chain amino acids. And the liver has almost no uh, amino transferase for the branch chain amino acids. So if you just look at the black arrows here, when we eat protein, the amino acids are, you know, the, the protein's digested and the amino acids are absorbed. The enterocytes have some metabolism, pass through the portal vein to the liver, and 50% of those amino acids that you consume at a meal are degraded on the first pass. <clears throat> They're oxidized and degraded before they ever reach circulation. The exception to that are the branch chain amino acids. There is no transaminase in the liver. So basically, the branch chain amino acids are reaching the plasma and ultimately peripheral tissues almost essentially in the exact proportion as the meal. That gives the opportunity to the muscle to sense the meal. These amino acids have become a signal or a marker of diet quality. I would love to know the evolutionary pressure that allowed that to form. I have no clue. <laughs> but the liver doesn't have the amino acid, uh, the transferases. And so these amino acids show up at the muscle as a signal of diet quality. I'm going to come back to that theme along the way. Before I leave that thought, I'd like to look a little bit at the metabolism further. And one of the things is if you're going to metabolize these amino acids in peripheral tissues, that's where the transaminase is, you've got all this nitrogen. And again, they're high quantity. And so basically, you need carriers. And the two carriers are, are, are uh, alanine and glutamine. And so those are going to be carriers of carrying both the nitrogen back, but also in shoveling carbon around. So we'll talk a bit more about that. If we look at the degradation of these three branch chain amino acids. Yep. Do you want to get the, the slides to show us? The oh, slides sorry. aren't showing. Yeah. Thanks. See if I can repeat it. OK, so the, wow, that's different. Uh, so the metabolism, uh, the first two enzymes in the metabolism, the catabolism of the branched chain amino acids are shared. So the amino transferase is basically an equilibrium reaction uh, driven by substrate concentration and produces the keto acids. The second enzyme is the dehydrogenase, which is the commitment step and basically takes the keto acids on down into oxidative pathways. The regulation of the 
dehydrogenase is at a kinase, uh, and that kinase is sensitive to the concentration of leucine and its keto acid, alpha keto isocaproate. Uh, interestingly enough, it's not sensitive to valine or isoleucine. It's only driven by the leucine concentration. And when leucine activates it, it's driven in about a two to one to one ratio. So two molecules of leucine will be degraded with one of each of the other two, which is an interesting combination. <clears throat> Last thing before I leave that slide, if you look at the bottom, leucine is one of, the only, one of only two that are ketogenic amino acids. Most amino acids carbon end up producing uh, gluconeogenic precursors where leucine produces ketogenic precursors. So with this background, we were doing a lot of work with uh, protein synthesis and looking at protein and aging and looking at what regulated protein over long periods of time. But we got interested in this leucine story. So the first study we really ran was uh, this one. And I want to walk through it because there were a couple of things we learned from this. So we, we knew the Goldberg data. We knew the, the data from Jim Jefferson and the others. And why would it work? Why wouldn't it work? So we did a variety of protein restrictions and uh, insulin deficiencies. But we, the starvation data was kind of interesting. So if we just look, first of all, this is incorporation of a labeled tyrosine as our marker. And so if you just look at the fed animals, these are ex vivo. So we're taking basically small muscles out of the rodents, the rats, and we're incubating them in a flask. And we use these small muscles because there's enough transport for it to work. And the first line here that I just highlighted, these are fed animals. So these are animals that when we dissect them, we find that their stomachs are full of food. Okay, so they're absorptive. These are fed. And if you look at it, as soon as we took the, mu the muscles out of the animal, they become catabolic. They're instantly catabolic. They lose the inner innervation, they lose the stretch, and they become catabolic. So if you look across the first line, when we added uh, 500, 500 micromolar, 0.5 millimolar uh, leucine to that incubation flask, there's a dramatic, almost a 50% increase in protein synthesis. So there's the anabolic effect. And you want to note the, the value, 0.21. If you look at then as we go down, and one of the things, you know, I, so this is an instantaneous catabolic condition, you know, just by taking it out of the muscle. If you then look at starvation over time, if you look at 24 hours, what you now see is the leucine stimulation is 59%, somewhat higher, but if you look at the absolute number, it's about 30 to 40% lower. So as it becomes more catabolic, leucine's still having an effect, but the effect is changing. And then if you look at 72 hours, now the leucine effect is down to 24%. So the more catabolic it becomes, the longer we're in the catabolic state, less effect of leucine. So that started targeting us the fact that this is really a first step. This is an initiation issue. And so at the time, we were studying long-term aging issues, and we were interested in capacity, capacity versus efficiency you know, changes at the transcriptional level versus at the translational level. And what we found with aging is there's a lot of things that are going on. Fewer ribosomes, fewer ribosomal subunits, more monomers, fewer mRNAs, the mRNAs are changing, less shorter poly A tails, the capacity for synthesis is going down. But what we're looking at is these acute changes, now we're looking at efficiency. If we've got a certain amount of machinery, how quickly can we activate it? translational control. The other thing we got out of this is looking at the two muscles. The soleus is a uh, red muscle, so it has a lot of mitochondria, a lot of metabolic activity, versus the EDL is a, is a, postural, is a uh, propulsion muscle. It's a white muscle, white fiber types, very few mitochondria, and much less effect. Okay, so a little background before I start using some of these terms. So this is uh, an overall look. Uh, I don't know if there's a way to get rid of that top bar, but um, this is an overall look at the translational regulation of protein synthesis. So right at the top, sort of covered up, uh, 
we have the, the ribosomes and the monosomes, and one of the, uh, and there's a lot of these protein initiation factors, and one that's covered up there is called EIF3, which is one that keeps the ribosomes active. It keeps the subunits apart so they can go into protein synthesis. We know that that one goes down with aging. It's a capacity change. The number of ribosomes go down with aging. That's a capacity change. But then we started looking at the translational regulations, so those are the ribosomes. Then we started looking at the translational regulations, and there's two groups that really come to mind. One that was getting a lot of attention at the time is EIF2, and it actually has a component also EIF2B. This is a regulation that is energy dependent. It basically activates the first tRNA, the mtRNA, which is the first uh, for the first codon for a protein synthesis. And this can be regulated either by energy availability or by amino acid availability, a lot of work that, that Dr. Anthony is doing. And so we know that was uh, important, but at the time it was being studied in the liver. It seems to be much more important in the regulation in the liver. We started looking at that and looking at the stoichiometry of it, and looking at the energy and looking at amino acid availability, and we made the decision that it's unlikely the EIF2 is going to be regulatory in muscle. So we turned our attention to another part of the system, EIF4. This is a multi-protein complex that brings in the messenger RNA to this first complex. So let me expand that a little bit more. Oh, well, and once that started, it goes on down and forms the 48S pre-initiation complex, and finally the mature ribosome for protein synthesis. Let's look at the EIF4 a bit more. EIF4 has four, uh, three major components to it, one called EIF4E, and in an inactive state, it's bound to a binding protein, BP1. So when they're bound, the system is inactive. That is a catabolic state, protein synthesis is down-regulated. So the first step in activating this is we have to phosphorylate that BP1 so it separates from 4E. So we're gonna look at that. I'm gonna come back to that regulation. Once we do that, the 4E can then bind to a second part, which is the 4G, and this forms the active complex, which then binds to the, to the mRNA and eventually forms that 48S complex. So the two things I want you to remember is the 4E, 4B, 4BP1 binding is inactive, and the 4E, uh, 4E, 4G binding is activation. Okay, so with that background, we started thinking about how we were going to test that. We knew that exercise created a catabolic condition. Endurance exercise, uh, exhaustive exercise, created an instantaneous exact uh, uh, catabolic condition. And so we thought this would be a perfect place to study this translational regulation. We had all of the capability of doing the protein synthesis, but at the time we did not have the antibodies to actually look at these initiation factors. So I knew that Jim Jefferson, Scott Kimball at Penn State Hershey had that. So I called up Jim and invited him out to Illinois for a few days. And we basically talked about our theories, talked about our hypothesis with EIF4. And to say Jim was skeptical was probably be an understatement. But basically, he graciously agreed to uh, collaborate with us on this. And so that sort of set up the next experiment. So basically, what we ran was we had a, a group of animals that we fasted overnight. And then we exercised them on a treadmill for two hours to exhaustion. Okay, So we have our control fasted CF, and we have our exercise fasted. And basically what we see is a dramatic decrease in protein synth synthesis as we'd expect, okay? So usually ranges between 30 and 50% depression acutely from protein synthesis. Oh, yeah, that would be great. Oh, oh, thank you. 
And so then we wanted to look at uh, dietary manipulation of this. So at the time, we wanted to do a complete meal. So we were looking at doing an oral intubation of these animals. So I reached out to Ross Labs and asked them to send us Insure. And a friend of mine was director of nutrition there, Pam Anderson, who was a PhD at Illinois, who was director of nutrition. She graciously did that, but not only did she send us the, the Insure, which is easy to get, but she sent us all the component parts, all of the powders. And so what we then were able to do is test the carbohydrate part versus the protein part, et cetera. And so what you see is with the exercise C, the exercise carbohydrate, we got almost no impact of carbohydrate and recovery of muscle protein synthesis after exercise. But when we gave the protein part, intubated it right after exercise, we got complete recovery. So that sort of focused on us and thought, you know, our hypothesis is right. So then we went on uh, to look at the initiation factors. So this, this is the same graph of protein synthesis. And so these, this is the 4E BP1 binding. So this is the reverse. So this is the inhibition. And so what you can see with the exercise fasted is a dramatic increase in the BP1 binding, the inhibition of that process. Giving a little bit of the, giving the carbohydrate, maybe a little bit of a reversal, but giving the protein meal, again, we totally reverse that inhibition. We phosphorylated the BP1, separated it, 4E is now available, and looking at the 4E, 4G binding, you see exactly that effect. When we go to the exercise facet, we have the depression, we give the carbohydrate, basically no effect, and we give the protein meal, and we get complete recovery. So logically, then we went on to the next experiment. Um, th this is all with you know Josh and Tracy in the lab. lab. <clears throat> we went on to the next experiment, uh, exactly the same conditions, but now doing specifically the leucine experiment. So if you look at the sedentary fasted and then to the exercise fasted, you see about a 40% drop in protein synthesis. We gave the carbohydrate meal, and in this case, no longer the insure mixture, we gave just pure glucose at about 15% of the total daily calories. And what you see is a dramatic increase in insulin, the on your left, uh, the increase in uh, insulin with the carbohydrate group, but no change in protein synthesis. There was a big debate at the time that recovery after exhaustive exercise, was it a carbohydrate issue? I mean, obviously there's glycogen depletion, so you have to do that, but it doesn't fully recover the, the catabolic effect of the exercise because it's not addressing the protein part of it. We then gave leucine. This was basically a large dose. It was 100% of what the rat would eat in the day. And what we see was a total recovery of muscle protein synthesis. And then the combined effect of the carbohydrate plus protein, maybe a little bit of a synergistic effect. Okay, so that basically, we now had, in our mind, basically proved that the four, the four uh, e, the, four, the EIF4 system was the key translational regulation, uh, and leucine was sort of a key to that from a nutritional standpoint. Okay, with that background, the next two decades saw a huge amount of research into this regulation. At the bottom on the right, you can see the EIF4 uh, uh, system, and along with that, the S6 ribosomal protein. These we now recognize are major regulators of muscle protein synthesis, and this all is organized through a protein complex that we know of as mTOR or mtor cm one <clears throat> I'm going to get rid of the clutter here, and I'll come back to it in a minute. <clears throat> but I want to basically look at some of these regulations. Across the top, <clears throat> across the top, there are four different primary inputs into skeletal muscle. There's the amino acid input, there's a hormonal input, particularly insulin, there's an energy input, and then there's a stress input, particularly exercise. <clears throat> These four inputs all have to be balanced to trigger mTOR, but they can be balanced in different ways. One of the ways is aging. So let me first do that, and then I'll come back to this. So this is some research from Stu Phillips' group in Canada, and they were looking at 
uh, protein synthesis in young males. So these are right at the end of growth curves, okay? These are young males, 22 year old. We think this is probably true of younger individuals, but you can't do the muscle biopsies on children, so we're kind of have to extrapolate that. But what you can see is with different levels of protein intake, you get a response of muscle protein synthesis at five grams, at 10 grams, at 20, you get almost a linear response. Little protein, more protein, bigger response. However, when you go to older individuals, you get a very different curve. Okay, this is really a theoretical curve. Nobody's ever actually done the titration curve step by step, but what you can see is that at low levels of protein across the bottom at 10 grams, at 20 grams, there's no impact on pro muscle protein synthesis at all. It requires 30 to 40 grams to stimulate muscle protein synthesis in a 65 or 70 year old individual. And if you look back at the leucine story, then what we know, and we know from the, you know, from research, is that at 1.5 grams or 1.7 grams of leucine, you'll get no impact on that mTOR muscle protein synthesis response. It requires at least 2.5, 2.7, 3, three and a half grams of leucine to actually stimulate it. And you can see that it's a fairly steep curve. Again, this is a theoretical curve I've driven, but we know kind of the points. So you know it has to be pretty sharp, okay? And it also, it's kind of asymptotes at the top. So while three may be enough, it may take four and a half to totally maximize it. But there's a range there and it's, and it's you know, sort of diminishing returns. And so back to that aspect again, we know that these can be balanced differently. If you're a child, a growing child, a 10 gram breakfast meal might be adequate to stimulate protein synthesis. It seems like it is. But if you're a 65 year old adult, it won't. That protein will not have an impact on muscle protein synthesis. So age impacts whether insulin is a growth hormone or whether it's simply a glucose manager. We know from research in my lab and also Teresa Davis and others that insulin in a, in a young child, in a, in a young animal, is a very potent growth hormone. But once they stop growing, it takes four times as much insulin to get the same protein synthesis response. The muscle becomes insulin resistance normally under growth conditions. So we have the aging effect. The other thing I wanna look at in that graph before I leave is the exercise component. So one of the things we know is that resistance exercise also increases the potential of th this mTOR system, okay? So more exercise actually lowers the threshold for the leucine effect. We know that post-exercise, that it, after a, a fasting meal, it might take 30 grams of protein to stimulate muscle protein synthesis, but after resist resistance exercise, 15 to 20 grams will work. So, Exercise is interacting with it through a molecule known as M, a RED1 to basically change that balance, okay? So if you take that and look at it in a reverse standpoint, the worst of all worlds is an aging individual who's sedentary with a low protein diet because that downregulates every part of the regulation. The well, last thing before I leave that slide, I want you to look under the energy. And energy regulation is also important, and it's regulated through an energy sensor known as AMP kinase. And if you look at the very bottom left, you'll see that AMP kinase again, and it regulates through another protein factor known as EEF2. This is an elongation factor, and I'm gonna come back to that later, okay? Okay, so now we know that meals are essential. Protein is important, and so we said, well, if the meal's important, how long does it last? And so we ran that study in looking at protein synthesis and the duration of the meal effect. And somewhat to our surprise, the duration's relatively short. After a meal, and it doesn't really matter too much how big the meal is, you get an anabolic effect in muscle of about two to two and a half hours. So that immediately started making us think about the way humans eat food, okay? In most developed countries, certainly in the United States, most people eat the majority of their protein in one meal. Typically in the United States, it's a dinner meal very late in the day. We get probably 65% of our protein after six at night. 
So if you think about that, when we're in sleeping, when we're in a fasted condition, muscles catabolic. And so when you wake up in the morning, your muscles are catabolic. And if you don't eat protein until nighttime, that means they stay catabolic all day. So basically, with the eating pattern of most adults in the United States, muscle is catabolic for 22 hours a day and anabolic for two. We started thinking this might actually be the explanation of sarcopenia. This is why we're seeing the muscle wasting in older adults. And so we then immediately started shifting our attention to how do we correct breakfast, that first meal when you come out of, when you come out of the overnight fast. Okay, so during that time, uh, so right away we're thinking about sarcopenia and aging, and, and the problem with aging research is it's hard to outlive your subjects, right? So sarcopenia is an issue of about 4% loss per decade. So you'd have to run a controlled diet study for two decades to probably pick up a difference. So we started thinking, how else could we stress this muscle system? How else could we look at compositional changes in manageable period of time, so we immediately turned our attention to, to weight loss, weight loss types of diets. And during that same time, there was a lot of controversy about diets. The Atkins diet was out there, the Zone diet with Barry Sears, um, and also we also had the whole concept of uh, metabolic syndrome or Syndrome X with Jerry Revens. And so people were debating diets between carbohydrate and, and fat. They were trying to decide which is more metabolically efficient or whatever. And that debate goes on in the Twitter world yet today. But at that point, we decided that they're missing the point that the real issue was carbohydrate versus protein. The real re metabolic regulation that everybody was ignoring was kind of under the, under the surface was the re relationship between carbohydrate and protein. So we made a sort of a leap of faith here that that theory was right, and we jumped over to a series of three human weight loss studies. And these are kind of interesting. I'm not going to go through all of them in great detail. I don't have time, but let me highlight how, what was thinking about. So this first study was small. We only had 12 subjects. But what made it unique is we fed every meal for 10 weeks, okay? We basically fed the breakfast and, and lunch in our food facility, and we packed out the dinner. So basically, we knew what they were eating, okay? <clears throat> Second study is a two-by-two two design of diet and exercise. So we're now going to combine exercise with the protein for the weight loss. I'll come back to that one. And then the third study was a long-term multi-site study, 120 subjects for a year-long study. All three of these use exactly the same diet, exactly the same protocols. Okay, in the first study, and this is true of all of them, what we did was we took overweight individuals, in the first study it's all women, uh, we looked to basically characterize a 500 calorie deficit. We wanted to lower their calories by about 20%. So everybody was getting about 1,650 calories. Everybody had exactly the same fat intake, okay? Basically, the dinner meal for everyone was about the same. The main difference was we moved protein into breakfast and lunch. So basically, if you look at the diet composition at breakfast, we now know that leucine is a trigger for muscle protein synthesis, somewhere around 2.7 to 3 grams. And we know that the average individual was eating about 10 grams, in, you know, based on NHANES data, about 10 grams of protein. So in our protein group, we're getting 33 grams high in leucine. And the, in the carbohydrate group, we're getting a typical low protein breakfast, low in leucine. After 10 weeks of controlled feeding, what we found was the, again, same calories, same fat. What we found is the individuals getting the higher protein lost about 8% more body weight. Wasn't statistically significant. But the issue with that, if you really look in the literature, in everybody that has always run these protein carbohydrate diets, the higher protein diet will always have the numerically higher weight loss. Sometimes it's statistically significant, sometimes it's not, but it always ranges from about 8 to 15%, depending on probably compliance, okay? But around 8%. But what was more important was the partitioning. 18% of the weight loss was body fat, 
eight, they had 18% greater weight loss of body fat than the carbohydrate group and 30% less loss of lean tissue, lean body mass. Also, by shifting the protein, lowering the carbohydrate, we got very different glycemic regulations, which kind of leave for a different seminar. But what we find is when we shift to more protein, it, we enhance gluconeogenesis. On the high carbohydrate diet, these people who are obese were running somewhat high fasting blood sugars. And the longer we made them comply with a high carbohydrate diet, the worse it got. And what we found is when they wake up after overnight fast, we also find big swings. They would go from high blood sugar to extremely low when they woke up, which we thought correlated with their increased hunger. We also see a decrease in, in lipid metabolism, particularly triglycerides. This is such a consistent finding that in our long-term studies, we use this as a biomarker of compliance. So if you're doing a higher protein, lower carbohydrate diet, if you don't see at least a 20% drop in triglycerides, you know they're not following the diet. It's that consistent. The second study was the uh, two by two diet and exercise. So we have protein carb and pro protein exercise type of thing. So this is a combination of resistance and endurance exercise. This study is four months long, uh, and they were getting about half of their meals that we were providing, okay? After four months, we see that they now have the higher protein group had 11% greater weight loss, which was statistically different. And look at the composition. It's exactly the same as the first study. 18% greater fat loss, 26% less lean loss. We're exactly targeting this compositional change. So here's the two by two data. If you look at the carb group alone, so this is just carb diet, it's the same as the very first study. What we find is that the composition of the weight loss, percent body weight, that about 65% of the weight loss is coming from fat, which means 35 is coming from lean tissue. If you look at the protein alone, it's 75% coming from fat. So it's targeting fat. If you look at the uh, carbohydrate plus exercise, it's about 84%. So exercise is targeting fat and, and protecting muscle. And then if you look at the combined effect of protein plus exercise, uh, what you find is that 96% of the weight loss was coming from fat. This was the first study, to my knowledge, that has actually looked at protein effect plus exercise and long-term weight loss. And what's interesting is it's all built around a leucine concept. If you look in the literature, you'll find some groups that were looking at higher protein, lower carb, but they weren't balancing the diet correctly. And so what you'd find is that their protein for the day went up, but they were in essence feeding a, a high carb, low protein orange breakfast. They were feeding a zone lunch and they were feeding an Atkins dinner. And for some reason it didn't work, right? <laughs> we found that if you actually target how you change breakfast, it always works. From that point now, uh, we sort of made the leap of faith that this breakfast, this partitioning of protein was going to make a difference. But obviously, in humans, we're sort of stuck with DEXA, which is lean body mass. So we don't really know we're protecting muscle. So we went back to the animal studies. And so Lane Norton in my, in my lab, we basically ran this study. And I'm going to take a few minutes to explain it because it's really cool, I think. But I'm a little biased. Um, basically, if you remember the human studies, we were using a 20% energy restriction. Rodents left to ad libitum feed overeat by at least 40%. You can restrict them 30, 20%, and that sort of normalizes them. So what we did was we took ad libitum animals that were eating about 17 grams per day, and we restricted them down to 14 grams per day, 20% restriction, just like the human study. And we then taught them to meal feed. So a small breakfast, four grams, a small lunch, and then a larger dinner, just like the human distribution, okay? A lot of people argue that rodents aren't small humans, that you can't look at metabolism. I totally agree. I would argue that people who think that aren't doing the rodent studies correctly. If you only ad libitum feed rodents, that has no relevance to human nutrition. Basically, humans meal feed and go through periods of fasting. If you train rats to do the same thing, their metabolism looks exactly the same. 
Okay, so then we trained them to do that for a week or 10 days, I don't remember. Uh, and then we sub randomly subdivided them into a balanced and an unbalanced distribution. So in the unbalanced distribution, we took those smaller breakfasts and we made them also light in protein, 8%. 8%, and then a large dinner meal, just like the humans eat. And you can see the leucine distribution. In the balanced, we made each meal 16% protein, again, comparable to what humans eat. And so we have our leucine distribution. The other piece of information we knew at this time, going back to that leucine threshold, we knew that in this age and, and, and size of rat, that leucine threshold for protein synthesis was at 60 milligrams. So if you look at the distribution here, in the unbalanced, we have two meals that are below the distribution, and in the balanced, we have all three meals above that, that threshold point. So now we're testing that effect of leucine. <clears throat> and so this is basically what we get. So after two weeks, and this is after the breakfast meal, so not surprising, what you see is in the balanced distribution, we have a higher rate of protein synthesis. And at 11 weeks, we still have a higher rate of protein synthesis. So that's not too surprising because we have a lot more protein and, and leucine at breakfast. But remember, these animals are all eating exactly the same calories, exactly the same calorie distribution, same fat, same carbohydrate, and same total protein. So when we took the animals and dissected the tissues at the end, what we found is that the animals with the balanced distribution had more muscle mass and less fat, exactly consistent with the human studies, okay? So this is a distribution. Everything else was 100% identical, protein, calories, everything. Okay, so at that point, we thought, well, I think we really have this concept of meal down, and we know that humans are, are eating in that unbalanced distribution. Research from various groups, Bob Wolf and Luke Van Loon and, and Stu Phillips and others, we now had a pretty good idea what the response range was for humans. Somewhere between 25 and 55 grams of protein was probably the response range. So basically, uh, we didn't have the potential to do the stable isotopes at that point or the biopsies. Our IRB wouldn't let us do those. So I called up a dear friend, Doug Patton Jones at Galveston, and asked him to collaborate on the study. So I just stop at the moment and, and just acknowledge uh, the tragic loss of Doug this past summer from uh, Kretzfeld Jacobs disease. Um, basically, uh, Doug was an incredible friend, a great a great individual to work with and an incredible scientist in this field. And it's really a tragedy to have lost him. But um, he, he was willing to collaborate at this point. So we ran this exact study. <clears throat> so this is the data. Um, and on the left is after the breakfast meal. So again, these uh, subjects are eating the exact same amount of protein, 90 grams. One is distributed evenly and the other one is skewed toward toward dinner. Uh, if you look at the black bar, basically um, on the even side, but, um, uh, oh, so if you look at the black bar versus the white bar, the, the black bar is basically day one. So we did it for seven days. We wanted to know if the, the effect was acute or whether it would be consistent. And so what you can see, it's consistent. After the breakfast meal, you can see that the even distribution has a higher uh, response than the skewed, but that's not surprising. More protein versus less, so you'd expect it to be different. But the real information is we did the net 24-hour protein synthesis. So again, they're eating the exact same amount of protein per day, just dif distributed, and what you see is the breakfast value held up. Basically, it determined the 24 out value to also be different. So we basically proved that point in both the animals and the humans. So back to the issue of the time course. We ran it initially with animals, in the graph on the, the left. Uh, Phil Etherton and Mike Rennie ran it in humans. And I think you can see that those graphs are almost overlaying. That length of the duration of the meal is about two to two and a half hours. They overlay each other. <laughs> And what we found is that after that two-hour period, what was surprising is that the plasma leucine is still up, is still elevated, and the 
initiation factors are still elevated. So why did it quit? So let me show you that data. This is kind of a busy graph. I've layered a lot of things on the same graph here. So the y-axis is percent increase, so that I can put a bunch of different things on the same graph. If you look at the curve at the bottom, the blue line, this is the protein synthesis line that I just showed you. It goes up and peaks at around 60 to 90 minutes, and it comes back to baseline after two, two and a half hours. If you look at the top in the black boxes, you can see that at two hours, two and a half hours, leucine is still fully elevated after the meal. It hasn't changed at all. It's still pooled and it's still very high in plasma and intracellular tissue. And if you look down at the initiation factor, the orange line is the 4E, 4G binding. You can see it's fully elevated through five hours. But protein synthesis stopped after two. So now we begin to get some of these conflicts back. When do you look and how do you look? Okay, Leucine is a trigger for the initiation start of protein synthesis. Once it starts, it has no additional role. So why does it come back down? So we thought about that for a while and we started looking at different things. I think it's, interesting, it's useful to look at protein synthesis in a little broader sense. So we've been talking about this initiation phase where the ribosomes come together and form an active complex. But once we have the active ribosomes, they then move along the messenger and through the process known as elongation and actually form the peptide chain. We knew at the time that a lot of the estimates from Waterloo and others were that protein synthesis uh, might account for as much as 25% of resting metabolism. So we knew this energy expenditure was a big deal. Protein synthesis is a big part of energy expenditure. And so we started wondering, could energy be the issue? especially in the elongation phase. So again, we called up on Chris Proud, who was one of the world's experts in EIF2 to collaborate with us, and basically we ran that experiment, and I'm not gonna go into great detail, but what we found was that after that protein meal, the energy was, expenditure was so high, ATP would go down, AMP up, we triggered that energy sensor, AMP kinase, which then phosphorylates the elongation factor, elongation factor two, and basically stops protein synthesis. So this is an energy protection that the muscle uses to not deplete ATP. At this point, we've published this, no one else has repeated it, so I can't tell you to take it to the bank yet, but I think this is the regulation and why there's a meal duration. Also, if you buy that, the other part of the story which is interesting is, in freshman nutrition, we always teach that protein has a higher thermic effect of food. And the freshman book says it's because of digestion, absorption, metabolism, and everybody immediately starts thinking about urea cycle. But the urea cycle is actually almost neutral in energy use. It doesn't nearly compare with the cost of protein synthesis. So we think the thermic effect of food is actually this triggering of muscle protein synthesis. Why do we see variation in the literature? Well, if you don't distribute protein at multiple meals and you only get one, you minimize the effect. And so if you distribute it correctly to multiple meals, you'll get multiple protein synthesis effects and multiple energy expenditures. And we think yes. that's part of the reason we see the weight loss and consistent fat loss we do in our experiments. Okay, so before I leave that topic, uh, I just want to highlight one other thing. When Doug Patton-Jones and I ran that experiment, I think we made a mistake in running it as an even distribution, because everybody is locked onto the fact of an even distribution. I don't think that's the issue at all. The issue is how many meals exceed the leucine threshold. And the only two meals we know that matter are breakfast, the first meal, and the last meal. To my knowledge, there has never been a single study of protein synthesis at lunch. And what I just showed you is the duration of the initiation factors are still up at five hours. So to my knowledge, there's no reason to think that leucine at lunch would have any effect because it's already active, okay? So I argue that it's not about an even distribution, it's about protein cycling. 
And I would like to see meals distributed through the day so that there are different ranges in that response. I would like to see the last meal high in the response range and the first meal high in the response. And frankly, I think the middle meal can be whatever you want. How many do we have? Sorry. Um, I'm just going to make a couple of quick comments. Uh, I'm a little behind here. Uh, if we look at energy expenditure and muscle, there are really three parts. There's fatty acids, which is the dominant part, carbohydrate, glucose, and branched-chain amino acids. The branched-chain amino acids typically are only about 100 calories per day. That's about all they have, so they're pretty minor. If you look at resting muscle, 80 to 85 percent of energy expenditure is coming from fatty acid. So no matter what you think about or hear about, Fatty acids are the dominant fuel of muscle. They're the preferred fuel. If you go out and exercise train, you train your mitochondria to burn more fats, okay? Carbohydrates are a fuel for intense exercise. So as you increase the intensity of an exercise, the fuel shifts toward carbohydrates and anaerobic metabolism. So somewhere around 60% VO2 max, the fuel mix switches, so now we have to rely on glucose and anaerobic metabolism producing lactate. We simply can't get enough oxygen into the muscles, we don't have enough mitochondria or whatever, and so we shift the fuel mix. <clears throat> One of the interesting things I mentioned at the beginning is where does this nitrogen go? And leucine and the branched chain amino acids are part of that regulation. I mentioned at the beginning that the dehydrogenase, the fact is the dehydrogenase, the pyruvate dehydrogenase is almost identical with the pyruvate dehydrogenase. Okay, so the, the E3 subunit is identical, the E1 and 2 are very similar, and what we know is that as you trigger the branched chain dehydrogenase, you'll actually inhibit the pyruvate dehydrogenase. And so what we now are doing is shifting muscle metabolism toward fatty acid metabolism, and we're capturing the glucose as pyruvate. And what Felig and Ruderman have shown is that during uh, a 90-minute cycling exercise, 70% VO2 max, so we're challenging glucose, <clears throat> is that 60% of the hepatic glucose release is coming from alanine recycling. So branched-chain amino acids, which oxidation goes up during exercise, they're actually fueling this glucose fatty, this glucose alanine cycle and, and, and maximizing glucose use. Where's the glucose coming from? It's actually coming from muscle glycogen, okay? We talk, and you know, again, freshman biochemistry is that uh, we can't release muscle glycogen into the blood, which we can't as glucose, but we release it as alanine, which goes back to gluconeogenesis in the liver, and basically you can stimulate uh, gluconeogenesis and glucose replacement. Okay, let me finish up with some comments. Um, so now I've kind of gone back and forth about leucine working or not working. There's a lot of people who would like to think leucine is some sort of an anabolic magical supplement, okay? Take, you know, go out and sell supplements and you increase your muscle mass. Hopefully you're beginning to understand that's not how it works. If we look at what leucine really does, one, it's a short-term recovery from a catabolic condition. Short term, right after acute exercise, short term overnight fast. If you've got a person who's been fasting for 48, 72 hours, leucine's not gonna have much effect. If you have somebody who's hospitalized with cancer who's been in the hospital for three weeks, leucine's not gonna have an effect, okay? It, it's not an anabolic hormone, it's a trigger for recovery of short term catabolic condition, okay? The second issue is you go out and look at some people who are giving large amounts of leucine, six grams on top of a, of a diet or whatever, but have they characterized the diet? So if the beginning diet already has 140 grams of protein in it, putting more leucine on top of it won't matter. If your basic meal has three grams of leucine, putting three more on it, you know, doesn't Turn it on more, it's already on. And so that's the second issue is what's the baseline protein? And then the third issue is the absorption rate. We know that this change in leucine has to occur quickly. You need to have an increase in plasma and intracellular fluids in about a half an hour. If you think about most of the research that's been done, it's been done with purified leucine or purified proteins. When you start doing mixed meals, 
fiber, fat, slower digesting proteins like casein, now you begin to flatten the curve and leucine won't work. So the idea that two and a half to three grams works in a pure um, whey protein, it might take four and a half to work in a mixed meal. So again, I like to use the 30 gram we used in the study with Doug Patton Jones was a proof of concept, but when I recommend it, I recommend breakfast in the 40 to 45 range. I recommend dinners in the 40 to 50 range to maximize protein synthesis. Okay, so what I hopefully have convinced you now is that leucine is an important marker of diet quality. It's not an anabolic hormone. It's a marker to the tissue of diet quality, okay? It's not a supplement. It's a marker. When we think about diet quality, which is getting a lot of attention right now, we're talking about more plant-based diets. And so diet quality, protein quality, begins to be a bit more of an issue. And so diet quality or protein quality is assessed by two factors. One is digestibility, and the other is amino acid score. Um, the current value is PDCAS, protein digestibility corrected amino acid score. We're also looking at something called DIAS. These are basically differ in the digestibility part, which is important. If you have a, a plant-based protein, say wheat, for example, a whole wheat product, it may only have 70% digestibility. So if it says there's 10 grams on the label, you only actually can absorb seven of it. Okay, so digestibility is an issue. But I think the bigger issue is the amino acid score. And that currently is not getting any attention at all. Amino acid score, if you look at the essential amino acids, there are nine of them, and three of them are almost always limiting in, in foods, particularly plant-based foods. So lysine, methionine, and leucine. You always need to keep your eye on. I think of amino acid score, and it's sort of like making a recommendation to me for about a vitamin pill. We don't really need the pill. We need the 12 vitamins inside the pill. Likewise, protein is really a delivery source. We don't need protein at all. What we need are the 20 amino acids inside the protein and the nine essential, and particularly the three I just mentioned. So let me show you what happens when you start thinking that way. So this is the current amino acid scores that are being used for diet protein quality. Uh, so the first one is the UNFAO 2007 guidelines. These are the ones that are actually being used. And I'll use lysine and, and leucine just for comparison. And next to it, uh, I have what's a more current uh, effect. Uh, and this is called an indicator amino acid oxidation. So the FAO numbers are based on nitrogen balance. We're trying to measure amino acid needs based on nitrogen balance. And this data dates back to the early 1980s with Vernon Young, okay? We haven't changed. So we're using nitrogen balance as a surrogate for metabolism. The IAAO developed by Ron Ball and Paul Pincharts in Canada basically is a metabolic outcome. Now we're looking at the individual essential amino acids and their requirements. So this is a much more metabolic oriented. And what you can see is that the numbers are about 30% higher. Okay, so if you think about that, most of you are probably familiar with the dietary reference intakes, which say that for every nutrient, we have a range of intake going from an RDA to an upper limit. There's a safe range. And within that, you should be able to make object uh, decisions. But below the RDA, we have what's known as the EAR, the estimated average requirement. And that's typically what we measure in the laboratory. So when Vernon Young was doing uh, those measurements of nitrogen balance, this was the average number. And what's important about that is at the EAR, 50% of the population are deficient. So the UN guidelines basically are at such a minimum level that 50% of the people will be deficient at that level. Okay? Then you need to step back and think about what's the goal. For the UN, the goal is undernutrition. It's an international undernutrition. It's trying to get people to a minimum diet to survive. 
On the other hand, if we're thinking about aging adults in a developed country, we need a different criteria. We need one that's more metabolically based, and that's where the IAO comes in. And frankly, from that, it's important to recognize the RDA is two standard deviations above that minimum number, okay? And so this is what the numbers start looking like. And what you can see is using the IAO method, these requirements start looking almost double the UN current number, okay? And again, just thinking about the protein requirement, the, the EAR, um, for, for total protein is 0.68 versus uh, the RDA is 0.8. And if you run protein synthesis data, uh, anything below 0.8, you can always see decreases in protein synthesis in muscle. Always see it. Okay, from that, the original data I'm showing you is milligrams per kilogram body weight. Okay, so now we want to change it over to a protein for measuring food, so we're going to transition that to milligrams per gram protein. Okay, how's that done? Well, in the FAO data, this is for the leucine on the bottom, they take the 39, uh, the, the 39 milligrams times body weight, 70 kg person, that gives you a target of 2.7 grams per day, okay, divided by the EAR for protein, 47 grams, really low protein intake, and that gives you their target, 58 milligrams per gram protein, or in other words, 5.8%, 5.8%. Where if you take the uh, metabolic number that corresponds to the RDA, now what you get is a number of 98 milligrams per kilogram per gram protein, or 9.8%. So let's look at that. What does that mean? So here's a list of some leucine-based foods, okay? In the first column, I've got the percentages of leucine in some foods. And what you can see at the top is whey protein, which we all know is high in leucine, someplace between 11 and 12%. And at the bottom, what you see is the grains. Okay, what we now know is that for a leucine benefit in muscle, we need to target 2.5 to 3 grams per meal, but the FAO target is 2.7 grams per day, okay? Based on the FAO data down here at the bottom, basically they say any protein that has 5.8% leucine is considered totally optimal. And so every protein on that list is considered optimal. So you'll go into your whole foods and you'll see that wheat protein or quinoa or whatever says it's an optimal protein. However, if you think about it from a different approach, what is it to optimize the leucine effects, 9.8, now you can see only the animal proteins can meet that. So, you know, what difference does it make? If you're trying to get a muscle effect, if you're trying to maintain muscle effect, you can do that with a meal of 23 grams of uh, whey protein, but it takes almost twice that, 37 grams of wheat, 40-some of quinoa, okay, that's over seven cups just to get your leucine requirement, okay? That's not doable, okay? So now we begin to see why when you think about complementary proteins, a plant protein and an animal protein blend is better. A roast beef sandwich, cereal with milk, you can do those kinds of complementary things because you can balance the amino acids correctly. If you use two plant proteins, you can never catch up with the leucine, lysine, and methionine numbers. And you say, well, you pick the wheat, why don't, you know, why don't you pick pea or soy? One of the things to keep in mind is that wheat provides 80% of the plant-based protein in the world. And that's true in the United States. So if we think about uh, adults shifting to a more plant-based diet, what are the unintended consequences of that? What are they actually going to eat? More wheat? That's going to be a serious issue of decreasing protein quantity and quality at the same time. So my last slide is basically to look at what does this mean if we have an amino acid approach to protein needs. If we use the FAO approach, which says we only need 2.7 grams of leucine per day, that would say our adequate protein is 34 grams, incredibly low. If we look at the current RDA, 0.8 grams per kg, that's around 56 grams, that would provide 4.5 grams of leucine. 
That would be enough for at least one meal anyway. If we start using the IAAO method, now we think that the minimum is around 5.6 grams. That gets us up to the current intake in the US. So currently, women in the US are eating about 70 grams of protein per day, getting about 5.6 grams of leucine. And in a 65-year-old population, 40% of the women are below this number. And so then we look up at the metabolic optimum we've been talking about, looking at optimizing leucine. Now we start talking about leucine values of eight to nine grams per day to optimize muscle health. And now we start talking about protein in the 100 to 120 grams per day range to optimize that. So all of this is assuming that you're eating a mixture of plant and animal-based proteins, which gives you a leucine content of about 8%. If you remember that table I showed you, it's kind of a mixture of plant and animal proteins. Obviously, if you're eating nothing but whey protein, you could get along with less. But likewise, if you eat more plant protein, you would need even more. So if you're going to shift to a plant-based diet, you're probably going to need 140 plus protein, grams of protein to be equal in muscle health. So with that, that's a lot of information and hopefully gives you a little idea of a career path that I've wandered along as I think about leucine and nutrition and metabolic health. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. nice overview of protein synthesis. What about the other side of the equation, protein degradation, and KIC, and HMB, etc.? I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> As Malcolm knows, we still don't have very good uh, ways of measuring uh, degradation. And so what we have are kind of whole body kinds of measures. We don't really have very good muscle measures. My starting point in thinking about degradation, though, is degradation is an essential process. 90% of protein degradation is getting rid of abnormal proteins, ones that have been damaged or gotten rid of. So I worry about people who are arguing that we should take something like HMB to, to slow down degradation because what's the ramification of slowing down getting rid of abnormal proteins? Okay, so I think A, we don't know enough to think about it very Clearly, we know that degradation is part of the turnover and absolutely essential. Uh, and I'm not fond of, of methods that we don't understand of trying to manipulate that. So that would basically be my thinking at the moment. Uh, I, think that, I think that we primarily regulate it under normal conditions on the synthesis side because it's so expensive. Obviously, in catabolic conditions, degradation becomes more important. Yes. Yeah. Thanks so much, Donna. Great talk, as always. But uh, question for you. So when you're looking at your weight loss studies, you focus a lot on, you know, kind of establishing the leucine threshold. You, in a, but you didn't talk so much about it. You have kind of a moderate carbohydrate background. Have you done any work or have you considered about, you know, changing the amount of carbohydrate and whether or not that might be beneficial, particularly on a background of, say, you know, a, you know fasting and exercise? So I'm thinking... Maybe there'd be some additional benefits if you had more carbohydrate early in the day when you wake up, or potentially more, you know, greater insulin sensitivity or after exercise. Maybe less carbs late at night when you're going to be resting to avoid, you know, triglyceride synthesis. Uh, great question. Um, we haven't done a lot with that. I think from the literature and from what we have done, uh, there are two sides of those out. Puts, you know, one is the protein synthesis in muscle, and then the other is glycemic regulation and triglyceride. So the lower you take the carbohydrate, the more you'll affect the glycemic part of that. So there's no question about that. As far as distribution and fat, I actually have the opposite opinion. I think that we should front load protein and keep carbs low because it allows you to get into more of a fat burning mode. There's some research known as metabolic flexibility that suggests that backloading carbohydrates to the end of the day will have least effect on your fat metabolism. So I sort of favor that, but uh, definitely lowering carbohydrate. My opinion is that for each individual, there's a carbohydrate sensitivity. And so if you, most people don't even know there's a carbohydrate RDA, 130 grams per day, but the average American's eating over 300. 
So the way I start thinking about it is target is 130. My target for people is 130 grams per day. And you basically earn every gram above that with exercise at a rate of about 60 grams per hour of exercise. And so if you're gonna justify 300 grams, you have to have three hours of exercise. So if, you're, you know, if you have insulin resistance, if you have triglyceride problems, I think you can go below the 130, but the 130 is a totally adequate diet. You can have five servings of vegetables, three servings of fruit, two to three servings of, of bread types of things, totally adequate diet, but Americans are eating 320. Okay, that's our problem with obesity. One in the back. Hi, thanks for a wonderful, thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, so I have one question: is whether some of some of the acute effects that you're seeing of leucine or protein meal could those be mediated by uh, acute changes in ketones, which now are considered to have regulatory functions? So in most of our studies, we measured ketones, so and they're not changing. They're, they don't change they're in that. They're not changing. So they're pretty flat. So beta-hydroxybutyrate and things are all pretty flat. So our carbohydrate levels aren't that low. Our average carbohydrate intake is around 140 grams per day. So we're not doing uh, ketogenic diets at all. I, I didn't mean that, but you know, because ketones now are being considered as regulatory effectors, not just uh, energy substance, substrates. I mean, it's possible the, that small changes. Body likes ketones. I mean, there's always been ketones. Anytime you're burning fat, you're generating ketones, and ketones are important fuel for the brain. Uh, they're an important fuel. So I think ketones are fine. I don't buy into the magic that the Twitter world su subscribes to ketones. I don't buy into that. I've done, in all of our studies, I can compare with Jeff Folick and, and Steve Finney who have done Atkins type diets and our outcomes are exactly the same. So you can either have a balanced diet with a sort of normal kinds of food or you can do ketogenic, whichever you prefer, but the outcome's the same. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for a fantastic seminar. Um, I sort of have a tangential question for you, and I'm curious to know what your take on this is, because you made a pretty compelling argument for increasing animal protein and reducing plant protein, or, or you know, you say a mix. Well, I made a compelling argument for not decreasing. Sure. I don't. I don't sure, know. but you know, the yeah. consumer world and our world is really seeing a shift towards increasing plant protein with the Impossible Burger and all these foods. And we just had a seminar a week ago from uh, Jessica Fanzo, who spoke from an ecological perspective about how, from a sustainability standpoint, it may be beneficial to reduce animal protein intake. So how does a consumer balance these sort of conflicting priorities, if you will? So, so I routinely give sustainability lectures so I could do another hour now. But to put it into a nutshell, if you're interested in, in climate change, then think about fossil fuels and stop thinking about food. Okay. Second, if you look at plant-based foods, basically 11% of the world's surface is available for plants and already fully operational. So if we stop using animal products, we're going to idle two-thirds of the world's land from food production. We can't afford that. There's no way to increase the plant production. 40% of the world's protein comes from animals now. We can't replace that. So as I said before, you're gonna decrease quantity and quality at the same time. We've never tried that before. The unintended consequences of going that way sounds nice theoretically, but makes, makes no metabolic sense, okay? Another point I was gonna make out of that and I lost it, but. Uh, oh, and the other thing right now, it's important to recognize in the United States that 50% of our fruits and 25% of our vegetables are already imported. The number one cause of greenhouse gas in the United States is transportation. And so to increase vegetarian diets in the United States, the only way you can do it is eat more wheat, grains. It's not vegetables because we have to import them. And the average food item already travels 1,500 miles before it's eaten. So the number one cause of greenhouse gas in the United States, the least sustainable, is transportation. And that's the only way we can have a more plant-based diet. Yep. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. This was an excellent talk. Um, I was able to follow along more than half, which means 
did a great job of uh, <laughs> making it accessible. Um, I just had a question about like the um, human behavior aspect. Okay. Um, you said that a lot of people go through periods of fasting throughout the day, like between meals. Um, sure. I just wanted to know how applicable that is to like the average, say, like office worker. Seems like general snacking is a major problem driving obesity. Totally. I totally agree. That is a major problem. <laughs> so I, I guess um, just this relationship between the constantly elevated insulin and how that might play along with, um, you know, like you said, with like the leucine signaling um, and just how do you tease apart those two populations? Um, I totally agree with all the points you're making. Um, I think one of the worst things that ever came along was the suggestion we have lots of small meals. Uh, the data that's based on was actually an artifact of the way Gil Lavelle ran the studies. We repeated those studies and showed that it was an artifact. So that idea of lots of small meals is really a plant-based argument because you're always hungry. Okay, uh, If you switch to a protein-centric meal and muscle-centric meal, what you'll find is you, you have much better appetite control, you'll have less hunger. Heather Lighty has shown that, we've shown that, uh, and basically you're less likely to snack. So basically one of the rules we always used in our weight loss is that your breakfast needed to be large enough that you had no interest in eating till noon. Okay, We totally avoided snacking. We basically didn't allow snacking. So that, I think, is a major issue. Uh, and one, it's one of the problems we see in the, the uh, epidemiology, is that when you go out and do epidemiology and trying to relate something, red meat to cancer or red meat to heart disease or something, what you have to realize is the epidemiology, the food data that it's based on is awful. And basically, it's not heterogeneous. It's, an, it's homogeneously awful. It's basically missing carbohydrates to the tune of maybe as many as 800 calories per day. And if you just look at something like Frito-Lays, Frito-Lays has seven lines of chips that sells over a billion dollars a year. Those aren't in the NHANES data. The snacking is not captured in the typical food questionnaire. But if you go out and get protein, and if I ask you how many eggs you ate yesterday, you'd give me the number. If I ask you how many how many ounces of milk you drank yesterday, you'd give me the number. If I ask you how many ounces of meat you ate, we buy protein by the ounce and the egg, and we know the carbohydrate, we buy it by the bag. So that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Echoing everyone else, I thoroughly enjoyed the talk. I have a similar question off of that, so thanks for bringing it up. Those, uh, there are individuals, obviously, who look at aging, increased health span, and look at fasting as a pro for that argument here, and, and very good points that if you fast, you don't get the benefits of the muscle synthesis and everything you need for sustainable activity as you age. However, where is the balance between, sure, you live a long time, but at what quality? So yes, they live a long time through their fasting mechanisms, the telomeres, all that, but what can they do in that process? So how do you make that argument to people who say, I'm fasting to live longer versus so, I'm fasting yeah. just to... So the, 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 two, the two pieces of that data are animal data and epidemiology data. Both are pretty weak. So let's look at the animal data. Basically, the longevity data for animal data uh, is freely fed animals. And so as I mentioned in the talk, animals overeat by 40%. So if we re calorie restrict rodents for their lifespan, basically we're just normalizing them. We know that obesity is a health risk. So claiming that as an energy restriction I think is misleading. It basically, the, uh, the issue is uh, we're restricting energy. And then they'll say, well, we restricted energy or we restricted protein and made them live longer. Well, the problem with that, as soon as you restrict the animal, they now turn to meal feeding because they'll eat it all in smaller periods. So now they're going through fed fasted cycles. So is it the fact that it had less protein or is it the fact that we've normalized their eating pattern, both calories and their, and their style, their, their diurnal rhythms? We don't know that, okay? Um, as far as the epidemiology, you know, you pick and choose. There's so many lifestyle things that, you know, what's the food, what's the exercise. What you always find is with those individuals, they tend to have less exercise, more alcohol, more smoking, higher weight. <laughs> they have all of the lifestyle issues, and so, of course, they have shorter lifespans. So, basically, we're making a huge extrapolation based on really bad data. Last question, and it comes from Gloria Dominguez Bello, who's the Institute Director, IFH Director. And she says the diet host interaction involves the microbiome. 
Microbial metabolites modulate insulin signaling. What is the role of the microbiome and microbial metabolites in response to diet and explaining variation in responses? <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> uh, Tracy, Tracy mentioned a paper that we just published in Aperture Communication three, four months ago, some work with a, one of my students who's now at Cedar sinai Suzanne Devkota, um, who is a microbiome expert far more than me. Uh, one of the questions I always had was, uh, uh, why aren't vegetarians more protein deficient than they look like they should be? And one of the thoughts I had was the microbiome. And most vegetarians who are really healthy vegetarians eat a lot of fiber. And so we started, we decided to ask that question in germ-free and different kind of mice to basically say, would the fiber basically allow the animal to develop a different digestive process? And what we were able to show is that in animals that were at borderline protein deficiency, exhibiting sort of an integrated stress response, uh, FGF21 from Tracy, uh, basically we showed that animals that were exhibiting that, if we gave them certain fibers, they would actually learn to scavenge nitrogen in a different way. They would tend to recycle it in a different way, and it basically alleviated the integrated stress response. So there's a lot of things that had to work exactly right to show that, but it highlights the issue that the microbiome is involved, okay? And what we found was that the cellulose component of the diet actually had a bigger effect than the water-soluble part of the vit of the uh, which we usually think is a prebiotic. So we, we showed that the amount of fiber and the type of fiber would actually change the microbiome. And what we found was that the animals, uh, monogastrics like humans, would actually develop a microbiome that looked like a cow. We would actually develop bugs that were present in ruminant animals that were capable of making essential amino acids, particularly lysine and methionine. So this was an adaptation of the microbiome to a specific kind of diet that suggested the microbiome could actually adapt to be more scavengers of nitrogen, which is exactly what a ruminant does in our food system. It takes bad plant-based uh, nitrogen and makes it into balanced amino acid proteins. Apparently, the bugs in the gut can do some of that same thing. Lecture, Thank you. Yeah, a very vibrant um, answer, question and answer period. A wonderful lecture. You went from translational human to policy, and we really appreciate it. Appreciate the inaugural um, seminar. Thanks everyone for coming, and this is now officially ended. We have an agenda.